So welcome to the seventh Darwin College lecture in this 2013 series, which has foresight as its theme. Now, long-term studies. Mention that phrase, and most scientists will give a wry, rather miserable laugh, look away, and whisper, if only. Funding systems generally demand answers within three years with citations and public impact. Charles Darwin, Gregor Mendel, they'd have a terrible time today, unless, like Darwin, they had uh, private support. David Keeling is a superb modern example. His carbon dioxide record from Hawaii changed the way we look at the world. But that magnificent greenhouse gas record started in 1958, and so now over 50 years long, was only funded by scraping a great number of barrels. And even that record has a break where he hit the bottom of the barrels for a while. So we study nature. But what do we know about ourselves? Remember Alexander Pope's words in his essay on man, derived from the inscription above the temple at Delphi. Know then thyself, presume not God to scan. The proper study of mankind is man. Now, civilization in large part is the process of getting on with each other. And that obviously means self-control. Moses brought the Ten Commandments to set limits and boundaries to behavior. Why do we have crime? We're the wealthiest society that ever existed, and probably the safest. Yet we have enormous problems in dealing with each other. Everything from celebrities and others succumbing to their hormones to the great crimes against all humanity that still happen again and again. Can we control ourselves? So it's a very great pleasure to welcome Terry Moffat here with us this evening. She's a very distinguished clinical psychologist who's received many international awards and honors. She is the Nat Schmidt Nielsen Professor of Psychology at Duke University in the US and also holds positions and works at King's College London and the Dunedin School of Medicine in New Zealand. She's been following a population representative cohort of 1,000 New Zealand children from their birth in 1972 to the present day. That's a remarkable study, nearly as long as Keeling's carbon dioxide record. So Terry, we look forward to your lecture on foresight and self-control. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction, Mary. Welcome, everyone. I'm really grateful for the wonderful opportunity to present some of our research uh, to you this evening. And what I'd like to do first is just begin by showing you a very short video clip uh, that was made by Television New Zealand. It only lasts 90 seconds, uh, and it announces a documentary about our research that will be shown on television later this year. We hope on the BBC uh, first of next year. So let me try that. What if we could take a baby and watch everything that happened to them from birth to grave? If we could examine every aspect of their life, look at everything that made them who they are, their genes, their physical well-being, their personality, their emotional ups and downs, criminal convictions, relationships, illnesses, successes, failures, the lot. Then imagine if we could do that for an entire city. Perhaps we could see or uncover what it is that really makes us all who we are. That experiment has already begun. It's probably the world's most successful longitudinal study of a general community sample ever. The Dunedin study is known in our field, in many fields, as a hallmark and landmark study. In 1972, a medical school from a small New Zealand city decided to take every one of the 1,037 children born that year and follow them for life. Those children have become the 1,000 most studied people in the world. For almost four decades, every aspect of their lives has been monitored in detail. The experiment is called the Dunedin Study. 
and it is now the broadest and most in-depth study of human beings in the world. If I had a list of the publications these world-class scientists and scholars have generated, I could probably go on for hours. It has become the richest and most productive archive of human development anywhere. It's an amazingly successful project, no question about it. So keep your eye out uh, for the film. It's called The Real Science of Us. Now, the Dunedin study has been going on for over 40 years now. It's produced almost 1,000 publications, one for every 13 days of the study members' lives. And we've got a variety of findings on different medical and social topics. Tonight's focus is going to be on one of our most recent projects, and that has to do with self-control, health, wealth, and public safety. Now, overall, our program of research aims to find ways to prepare today's children for tomorrow. There are several reasons why we think this preparation of today's children is going to be important. Demographers tell us that there are fewer children, uh, and thus our children are going to become increasingly valuable to us. At the same time, uh, there are more and more older people, and that's obvious, just look around you. Um, means that each of these young workers is going to need to support more and more of us old people. And then also life expectancy is growing longer and longer, so not only must today's children prepare to support us, but they must prepare for their own longer old age. Now I'll show you next the classic age pyramid that demographers give us. Uh, the blue side of each pyramid shows males and the pink side shows females. The horizontal rows represent the size of the popula population in each age band. At the bottom, it shows you how many children there are. At the top, how many old people. And in the middle, how many adult workers. These are data from Brazil, and I show you the data from Brazil just because they make such a beautiful pyramid. But you can see that in 2000, most of the population were young. In 2020, we see those children moving up the pyramid to become adult workers. And by 2050, it's projected that most of the Brazilian population will be old people. Now, this slide shows you the population pyramid for Western Europe, and that includes Britain. Uh, and you can see that we're already well ahead of Brazil in this population shift. So already, every British child is becoming more and more valuable to us. Now, what I'm showing you here is an outline of the lecture, uh, so you can follow along to see how the lecture is progressing, and if you become terribly bored, you can know just how much longer. Uh, so let's just begin by asking, why study self-control? Now, I'm going to show you evidence from the Dunedin study that childhood self-control predicts success and failure in adult life above and beyond intelligence and family wealth. The reason that that's important is because everyone already knows that success in life follows from high intelligence and good family socioeconomic resources. But it's also known that it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to eliminate the wide differences between people on their intelligence and their social class background. And in contrast, self-control skills are thought to be something that might be teachable. So we asked our data, would teaching self-control to children really improve important indicators of their life success? Now, another reason we chose self-control is that today there's new scientific interest in self-control uh, as a topic by researchers and policymakers, and they're so interested because it's thought to be more necessary today now than ever before in world history. So we need our self-control to avoid becoming obese because we live in an era of ready food availability. We need our willpower to maintain physical fitness because we live in an era of sedentary jobs. We need self-discipline and forbearance to sustain our marriages because it's so easy to get a divorce. To prevent addiction, we need our willpower because we live in an era of easy access to addictive substances. We must resist spending because we live in an era where marketing is sophisticated and seductive. And we need now to save for our own old age because we now live in an era without guaranteed pensions. Sounds grim, eh? Uh, 
So next I want to just tell you about the Dunedin study. And to do that, we need to travel down to New Zealand, where we did our research on self-control. And the first thing I'll do is show you the design of the study. Um, so I'll walk you through this slightly complex slide. First of all, we studied all the babies born in one city in one year, 1972-73. There are 1,037 of those children. Now, the cohort represents the vari variation in the full population. The children represent all walks of life and all ability levels and all kinds of social class backgrounds. At the top left, you see that uh, each, on the left-hand side, you see that each age that the study members have come into our research clinic for their assessments, so three, five, seven, nine, and so forth. Um, and on the bottom right is an important piece of information. So by the end of last April, uh, we did finish seeing the cohort, and 96% of them took part when they were 38 years old. And this is important because it means that those who've been unsuccessful in life have not dropped out of the study along the way. So the findings that I will show you today do represent the whole population. To show you what this kind of longitudinal follow-up is like and bring it alive, I want to introduce you to two of the young study members uh, to give you an idea. And I'll introduce you to them on the day their mothers enrolled them in the project. So here they are. Um, and then I'll show you the ages which, when data were collected. So they were brought back to the unit at age three, five, seven, nine, 11, 13, 15. 13 is a tough age, isn't it? Let's look at that. <laughs> this is when I joined the study, <laughs> to study adolescence. Uh, so 15-year-olds, 18-year-olds, also a tough age, I think, 21-year-olds, uh, 26-year-olds, 32, and last April at age 38. Now, each year when we bring them in, they come for a full day of physical and mental tests, and the child or young person is seen, but also we collect data from their parents, their teachers, their partners, their friends, and increasingly from linkage with government administrative uh, records as well. So let's go back now to our central concept for the Foresight Lecture, which is self-control. So we measured each of the children's self-control in the first decade of life by assessing the kinds of qualities that you see here. So if the child was impulsive, acts without thinking, can't wait his turn, has a low frustration tolerance, dislikes effortful tasks, has fleeting attention, lacks persistent, often goes for the risky activity, requires constant attention and monitoring uh, and motivation from an adult. Now, of course, every child shows poor self-control at some point. We all know about the terrible twos when self-control deficits are developmentally normative, and we know that small children have not got much self-control. Uh, they're not supposed to have much. That's why they are born with parents, uh, to replace that. Uh, so one of the things that we do in this research is to look to see whether children are having self-control problems at multiple ages and in multiple settings. So what I'll tell you about today is based on a composite measure of self-control. Um, that uh, ask whether the child's style in those behaviors that I showed you, such as waiting his turn or having a poor frustration tolerance, whether that style has persisted across ages three, five, seven, nine, and 11 years, uh, and whether it's been reported to us by multiple reporters. So we had the research staff had made observations of the children's self-control when they came into the clinic for their examinations. We had their parents fill out checklists. Uh, and we had four different teachers fill out checklists about their self-control at age five, seven, nine, and 11. And then at nine and 11 year olds, years old, the children themselves were asked about difficulties they may have had with self-control. So we put all this information together, and that means that when I speak today about poor self-control, I don't mean just a single in instance of a temper tantrum. Uh, I mean a persistent and cross-situational pattern of poor self-control. So now, what are the consequences of poor childhood self-control for adult life? We need to fast forward 30 years, and I'll tell you a bit about how we measure their outcomes today. 
So in their late 30s, when our study participants visited our research unit, we assessed their physical health by using a full day of different medical tests and examinations. So we uh, ascertained their cardiovascular fitness in uh, a series of medical examinations. Uh, we look at cardiovascular health in terms of endothelial function uh, and blood pressure. Uh, we have anthropometric examinations for, to measure their obesity, body mass index, and fat content. Uh, we take their blood pressure. Uh, we ascertain their lung function with a series of respiratory tests. And their very favorite, the end of day dental examination. Uh, so we even look for periodontal disease. We also do collect blood from them to do laboratory tests such as cholesterol, uh, inflammation, systemic inflammation, uh, sexually transmitted infections, and things of that nature. So to make one measure to summarize their health for this lecture this evening, I counted up whether each of the study members had clinically abnormal levels on metabol metabolic abnormalities, and that would include obesity, uh, on periodontal disease, on sexually transmitted infections, on elevated inflammation levels in the blood test, and if they had respiratory difficulties in the lung examinations. And the next slide shows you that indeed poor childhood self-control was linked to the number of these different health problems that each study member had by their late 30s. So I'll explain how these charts work because you'll see a lot of them. Uh, so the cohort of children, across the bottom you would see five groups. This is the cohort of children, 1,000 children, divided into five groups from low self-control to highest self-control. Um, and so each one is one of the dark gray bars, and each of these groups contains about 200 children represented in that gray column. And then if you look up the height of the chart, that indicates the number of health problems that I just showed you. So if you uh, look at the slide looking from your left to your right, you will notice a gradient. The poorer the children's self-control on the left, the poorer their adult health, the more of those health problems they had in the clinical range. I want you to keep an eye on this gradient because you're going to see it over and over, uh, and we think it's very important for policy implications. So we've also introduced a fascinating new assessment into our research into health this year, and that's imaging the retina. Um, when you look at uh, blood vessels in the back of the retina, as you see here, they provide a window onto what's happening to blood vessels inside the brain. So the retina is an accessible part of the occipital lobe of the brain. Uh, using retinal imaging, it's possible for us to grade the microvasculature in the eye to try to get a sense of who might be at risk for neurovascular disease like strokes in the future. So in this slide that I'll show you next, we've plotted the width of retinal venules, and that shows you with, that children with poor self-control in the first decade of life have much wider retinal venules when they reached age 38, and that means that they are already at some statistical risk for neurovascular disease as they age. So one way to think about how self-control affects a person's health is to think about the pace of aging. And this is what we will study in the Dunedin cohort as we follow it forward from here on out through the years. So whether we consider the health of their bodies or their brains or their faces, as you see here, some of them are aging faster than others. Uh, and childhood self-control predicts the pace of aging. Now, this slide brings up uh, the interview with the clinical psychologist about substance dependence uh, and drug addiction. We counted up the number of different substances that each study member was dependent upon. They could be dependent upon alcohol, uh, can tobacco, alcohol, cannabis, or other street and prescription drugs. And we also had their self-reports corroborated by informants who knew them well. 
So here are the outcomes for addictions. The children who started life with poorer self-control said at age 38 that they were addicted to more different substances in adulthood than children with better self-control. And this is shown in the red line. Those are the study members' self-reports to the clinical psychologist. The blue line is also very useful. And this is where we verified their self-reports uh, by turning to reports provided about the study members by people who knew them well. And these, in most cases, were parents, partners, friends, and co-workers. It's an independent way to verify findings based on self-reports in the event that one doesn't trust these entirely. Uh, and that might be wise in the matter of addiction to illegal drugs. But what you can see is that the blue line looks just the same as the red line. So whether we interviewed the study members themselves about their addiction problems or whether we asked their informants, we see the same thing. As adults, children who had poor self-control on the left were likely to have more problems with addiction. So let's move along now to their wealth. And first, we'll just look at standard indicators such as income and the prestige of their occupations. This slide shows you that the children with poor self-control were earning less money than their more self-controlled peers when they reached adulthood. That's the light blue line. And their occupations were also less prestigious and less skilled. And that's the dark blue line. And again, you can see this fits a gradient. Next, we'll look at their financial planfulness for the future. We interview the study members extensively about their financial situation, and we ask them a lot about their attitudes towards saving and saving behavior. Is saving, how important is saving for the future uh, to you? Do you save money by putting it, putting it away each month and not touching it? And we look at financial building blocks in their 30s. Do they already own their own home? Have they made any beginning investments? Do they have a retirement plan? And we saw that the children with less self-control, when they reached their late 30s, were less oriented towards saving and had accrued fewer assets as building blocks for their financial futures. We also interviewed them about their financial struggles. And here we ask about money management difficulties. Do you find it difficult to meet the cost of rent and mortgage and phone and heating bills and major repairs? And my personal favorite, do you find yourself living from paycheck to paycheck? Uh, and then we also look at their credit problems. Have they been turned down for a credit pro uh, card, sold belongings to a pawnbroker, uh, and things of that nature? So it's quite an extensive interview. And here you see that uh, the green line shows you the lower their childhood self-control, the more financial struggles they were having in their 30s. The purple line shows that their informants, people who knew them well, agreed with that. They, uh, were more, the informants were more likely to say that the study member was a poor money manager uh, and wasted resources that the family <coughs> needed. Uh, then most recently, just in the past couple of months, we've been able to uh, merge our files with those of a credit rating company for Australia and New Zealand called VEDA. Um, and uh, we obtained their data for each of the study members' credit ratings. And these are very interesting data. We're just beginning to look at them now. At any rate, the range for a credit rating uh, in Australia and New Zealand is a score from 100 to 1,000, and 700 is a good rating. Um, below a 700, you will have difficulty getting credit without providing clear collateral. And here you can see that the lowest uh, self-control children grew up to be adults who are having a credit rating well below 700, whereas the high self-control children on the right are more likely to be able to get a mortgage. Now we'll move along to crime measures. We looked at the study members' court convictions at all courts in New Zealand and Australia. And here we did this by searching the uh, central computer systems of the New Zealand police, which links in with any kind of uh, com arrest or conviction anywhere in Australasia and the South Pacific Islands. We do have 10% of our study members who are living outside that zone, uh, many of them here in Britain, and so uh, they are not included in uh, this analysis. Or actually what we do is we uh, 
uh, weight their conviction score by the number of percentage of months in their life that they have lived inside the jurisdiction of the police uh, records that we use. And so here you see that the um, percentage of the cohort members in our sample who've been convicted of a crime by their late 30s also varies by self-control. So if you remember across the bottom of the slide, you see the children in the cohort who are divided into five groups from lowest self-control to highest self-control. And each group, again, contains about 200 children. As adults, the children with poor self-control were more likely to have been convicted of a crime. I can also tell you these are data just showing you for any conviction, but um, if you look at recidivistic offenders who've been convicted more than once, the um, shape of our gradient becomes even steeper. And then if we ask of those who have spent uh, time in prison, we've had uh, 44 of the original 1,000 study members have spent time behind bars, and 85% of those young people came from the two lowest self-control quintiles of the cohort. So self-control is tightly concentrated with crime, which the people here at the Cambridge Criminology Institute could have already told us. Okay, what about parenting? So we ask if poor childhood self-control also has intergenerational effects. By their late 30s, 750 of the study members had become a parent. And when uh, any study member has a first child who reaches the age of three, at that point we carry out a home visit and their uh, research workers go through with the parent and with their three-year-old toddler uh, a series of tasks that are uh, meant to elicit different kinds of parenting under different circumstances. And that's all videotaped, the parent-child interactions. The videotapes are then sent to a team of experts on parenting um, at uh, Penn State University, and they code the videos for the study member's warmth toward their toddler, their sensitivity to the child's needs and communications, and the amount of intellectual stimulation that they give to their child. And these coders in Pennsylvania are blind to all information about the history of the study members. So what we learned is that the less self-control they had in childhood, this translates directly to less skilled parenting when the study members grow up and have their own three-year-old child. They are less warm, less sensitive to their child's needs, and they provide a less stimulating environment for child development. Once again, this follows a gradient. So you're probably saying to yourself by now, just a minute, hold on, I bet the reason that poor self-control seems to make such a big difference is because children with poor self-control tend to come from the poorest homes or have low intelligence or perhaps they're all boys or they probably have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Uh, these are great alternative explanations, but they don't explain the data away. So we recalculated these self-control gradients and looked at them again uh, in different subgroups just to test this out, and we found that the gradients look the same in children from the highest income families, in children from above average with above average IQ, and in girls, and in children who do not have any diagnosis of ADHD. And I, I must confess, though, that the mean on self-control for the girls is here, and for the boys is here. So the distributions overlap, but uh, girls definitely have a step ahead on self-control. Now we want to look at adolescent mistakes. So, so far I've emphasized early childhood, but we've also looked at the Dunedin study members' teenage years, because it's possible that all these poor outcomes in adulthood that I'm showing you have happened to them because the low self-control children made mistakes while they were teenagers. And that would mean that the poor outcomes could be reversed or prevented uh, with programs introduced at secondary school level. So, yes, we found that the Dunedin study members who had the lowest self-control did make the most mistakes as teenagers. So you, here you see three examples. Those with low self-control were the most likely to start smoking uh, as teenagers, uh, to start smoking cigarettes. They were the most likely to leave secondary school without any qualification, and they were the most likely to have an unplanned 
baby uh, as a secondary school student. Now, if you imagine a utopian world where teenagers did not start smoking and did not drop out of school or did not have an unplanned baby, then what we can do is to see if these kinds of mistakes accounted for all of the poor adult outcomes. So we looked at the Dunedin study members who had this kind of utopian adolescence. We divided the sample up and selected those for analysis who did not smoke, did not drop out of school, and did not have a baby as a teenager. And this slide shows you the result of that. So these are the data, the count of clinically, uh, clinical level health problems that I showed you before. The green line you've already seen a few minutes ago. Uh, and this shows the self-control gradient for health problems that we've already seen. The yellow line shows you the same effects of self-control on health outcomes, but in the utopian subsample of people who did not make a mistake as a teenager. What's interesting is that all of these utopian teenagers had fewer health problems as adults, and that means that the whole gradient is moved down, downwards for them. And that shows you how an intervention could really work, how the amount of health problems in the population could be lowered if children at all levels of self-control improve their self-control skills. But it's still the same gradient shape, to my dismay. And this means that even among those young people who did not make a mistake as an adolescent, childhood self-control still predicts how many health problems they will develop years later in their 30s. This shows you the same effect for wealth uh, in terms of their adult income. All of these utopian teenagers had higher incomes as adults, so that means the whole gradient is moved upwards for them. They make more money now that they're 38 years old, but it's still the same gradient shape. It means that even among those who did not make mistakes as a teenager, childhood self-control is still predicting how much money they will earn years later as adults relative to their peers. So our next step then is to isolate self-control itself as, the active, as an active ingredient. So in the Dunedin study, we were able to use statistical controls for family income in order to show that a child's self-control was important beyond his or her family socioeconomic background or parental income. But as you know, there's a lot more to family life than just money. So we wanted another way to isolate self-control as the active ingredient in child development. And one way to do this is to look within one family and compare two siblings. So you have on the top there sibling one, who's shown as running about and showing his poor self-control. Um, and in theory, he's at risk for higher risk for poor later outcomes versus the other sibling who's at the bottom, sibling two, who is shown sitting reading a book, uh, demonstrating relatively better self-control um, and should have, in theory, better adult outcomes. So the question for this research then is, do these two siblings have different outcomes even though they grow up in the same home with the same parents? So this question gives me an opportunity to tell you about our other newer longitudinal study, and for that we have to leave New Zealand and travel back here to Britain. So in the 1990s, we began this new longitudinal study. Uh, we designed it along the same model as the Dunedin study, but this time with the advantage of recruiting twins. We enrolled a national sample of twins born in the UK uh, using uh, the registry of multiple births. Uh, and here you see them on their first day of school in 1999. Uh, the study is called the Environmental Risk Longitudinal Study. Um, it's a 1994-95 uh, birth cohort, 2,200 uh, twin pairs. Uh, it's nationally representative, and we achieved that by oversampling teenage mothers who gave natural birth to twins and undersampling older mothers who uh, conceived their twins with uh, uh, assisted reproduction because the older mothers tended to be better educated uh, and ha have higher incomes, and we wanted to have a more representative sample. 
Um, half of the twins are dizygotic fraternal pairs, half of them are monozygotic identical pairs, uh, and we have uh, done home visit assessments to them at age, at birth, age 5, 7, 10, 12, and right now we're doing the age 18 follow-up. And as at the last time we saw them, they were still 96% miraculously taking part. Um, so we measured both of the twins on self-control when they were five-year-olds, and we used exactly this same type of measurement that we did in the Dunedin study. We had this, the research workers observe the twins and make their ratings. We had the mothers make their ratings of the twin self-control problems, and the teachers make ratings of self-control problems. And we combined that to make a composite of each five-year-old's self-control across situations. So now we fast forward to their adolescence. We compared the twins on uh, problems they had when they reached adolescence. We looked at school failure because that's the best predictor of adult wealth. And we looked at adolescent smoking because that's the best predictor of adult health. And we looked at juvenile delinquency because that's the best predictor of adult criminal convictions. And we counted those up, uh, those kinds of problems up here. And what you see is that on average, the twin who had lower self-control at age five had more of these kinds of problems already by secondary school. And that's the left-hand bar. And this is despite the two twins having grown up in the same home with the same parents in the same neighborhood and the same school and in many cases attending the same classroom. We also added uh, statistical controls for any initial differences between the twins in their birth weight or their intelligence test scores, just to be sure. So from this analysis, we learned that it's not just the family into which you're born that matters. It's whether you're able to develop self-control as a five-year-old that counts quite a bit too. So now we wanted to look at what are the costs to a nation. I've shown you that self-control affects the lives of individual people. Uh, we also wanted to evaluate the importance of childhood self-control for society. If you remember, I began the lecture saying that every child is becoming more valuable. We have a big job for these children to do. We need them to reach midlife healthy uh, and hopefully wealthy so that they can support us in our old age. Uh, so, what's the cost of poor self-control to a nation, to us as a larger social group? So to do this, first we looked at the cost of self-control in schools and classrooms. So when the British twins were 12-year-olds, we asked their teachers how much effort does it take to have this child in your classroom? So we asked them, compared to his classmates or her classmates, how often must you act to keep this child's attention on task? How often must you act to curb disruptive behavior by this child? How often does this child's behavior make it frustrating to work with him or her? How often does this child need one-on-one -on -one interaction from you? How often must you give this child extra encouragement to get him or her to take part? We could not find any measure in the developmental psychology or educational literature of teacher effort, and so um, these questions were written by my mother, who is a, uh, is, has a long career as a very patient and kind teacher, uh, but she knows what gets on her nerves. So she was able to quickly write this, this questionnaire for teachers for us. So here you see the old familiar gradient. The less self-control the child had at age five, the more effort the teacher said she had to use to manage that child in the classroom seven years later uh, at age uh, 12. Um, so children with low self-control take effort and energy away from teaching other pupils. Uh, they reduce teacher job satisfaction. Uh, this may, in fact, lead to increased teacher turnover and may um, potentially even affect uh, keeping good teachers in the workforce. So there's potential large cost to our education system of children with low self-control. We also wanted to look at economic measures of cost to government. And to answer this question, we returned to New Zealand, uh, and there we collaborated with the New Zealand government. 
Uh, we looked at the government records of social welfare benefits used by our study members, uh, and we learned three things from doing this. First, almost half of the Dunedin study members had received some social welfare benefits after they turned 21 years old. That's a lot of people, half the New Zealand population receiving some kind of a benefit. The next thing we learned was that childhood self-control did not predict whether someone would need a government benefit. And this goes to show that many people do need a helping hand and can benefit from a safety net, especially during the kind of weak economy that we have today. Uh, but this next slide shows you the third thing we learned, which is an eye-opener, and that is that self-control did predict how long adults stayed on government benefits. So on average, the Dunedin children who had the poorest self-control in the first decade of life were likely to be supported by government benefits for six years uh, after age 21. And those with the best self-control were more likely to be uh, supported by benefits for about a year, uh, if not less. So clearly the cost of poor self-control to the New Zealand taxpayer is not trivial. And costs to political attitudes are important. Most taxpayers want their country to have a safety net. And they don't want, what they don't want is for recipients to become dependent upon social welfare benefits and stay on them for many years. Uh, Long-term benefit dependence is the thing that pol politicians say undermines public support for a good social welfare system. So that's why we think this finding about duration of welfare benefits linked to childhood self-control could be potentially important. But are, are they happy? So I'm um, often asked, uh, but don't the children who have the highest self-control all have obsessive compulsive disorder? <laughs> um, maybe they all turn out to be academics who work too hard. Uh, but really, if it were possible, people wonder if it were possible to do something to increase self-control in the population, would we be inadvertently creating a population of, a hum of humorless robots, uh, people who lack spontaneity and creativity, and people who are incapable of personal happiness? Um, so we have start, risen to the challenge and started to do some work on this. Uh, we interviewed the Dunedin study members this year about their satisfaction with their lives. Um, what a nice thing we learned is that most of the people in their 30s in New Zealand say they're satisfied with their lives, so over 70% of them felt very satisfied. But the most satisfied of all were those on the right-hand side of the slide, and those are the people who began life with high self-control. Uh, we're also looking into their um, creative achieve achievements. So we have study members who have um, written books. We have study members who have um, are opera singers, study members who have made all kinds of wonderful accomplishments, uh, business entrepreneurs, uh, engineers with many patents and inventions. And we're looking to see whether self-control predicts that kind of life achievement, that kind of creativity, uh, as it were. Uh, as it turns out, self-control does seem to contribute to uh, creativity in the arts, or at least it, it contributes to being able to turn creative ideas into products, uh, such as symphonies or performances or um, uh, poems or published novels, that kind of thing. Um, and also self-control does seem to contribute to creativity in uh, engineering, uh, in the STEM sciences. Uh, it's very important. Where it's not important at all is in athletic achievement. So New Zealand is a country of athletes. Uh, they always punch far above their weight in the Olympics. And we have uh, Olympic athletes and other talented athletes in the cohort. And it doesn't seem to have been related to their self-control at all. So we need to learn more about that. It's nice to find something that's not related to self-control. <laughs> so what about implications? Uh, I've shown you multiple outcomes. Uh, you've seen that self-control in early childhood predicts many important outcomes. If it were possible to improve self-control skills, doing this might lower costs to government and to taxpayers for things like crime control, health care delivery, and social welfare benefits, and maybe even education. 
Uh, children who begin life by learning better self-control ought to end life healthier and better prepared financially for retirement. This would reduce dependency in old age and improve uh, quality of life. What about for the next generation of children? We saw that the Dunedin study members with low self-control were less warm, less sensitive, and provided a less uh, stimulating environment for their own three-year-old toddler's development. They were also likely to have low incomes, poor health, a criminal record, and to be substance abusers. So you can see that this depiction is not an ideal uh, situation for parents rearing the next generation of children. Right, so uh, I wanted to ask you about the gradient, and I've, I've missed a slide here, but I'll just tell you about it. When we published the gradient that you've seen, uh, many people found it very surprising. Uh, it's gotten a lot of attention from academics and researchers, particularly economists uh, didn't like it for some reason. Um, most people, including me, I have to say, would have thought that there are a few children who lack self-control, and maybe they're just a small number of children who have ADHD, and those few children need a targeted individual treatment by a mental health professional. So I grew up in clinical psychology. My idea of what you do with children with poor self-control is an American idea. You put them on Ritalin, and that will fix everything. <laughs> um, but our findings suggested something quite different, and what it suggests is that uh, children who uh, have self, poor self-control uh, come from all intelligence levels, they come from all uh, social backgrounds, they're rich as well as poor, and what the gradient suggests is that even well-to-do children, even bright children, even children who are above average on self-control to start with could benefit from developing better self-control skills. So they suggest a, um, the gradient suggests a universal intervention approach. So what do I mean by a universal intervention approach? And here we have an example of that. Uh, Sesame Street Children's Television Programming. So there's a program now called For Me, For You, For Later. And Sesame Street designed this programming on the basis of research by us and by others about the importance of childhood self-control for later life. Uh, in the programming, the puppets Elmo and Grover and the Cookie Monster show children how to save money and how to delay gratification, how to put some money aside waiting to buy the really big cookie. Um, so this really is working with children to get them to um, think ahead to the future, to get something you really, really want that's worth waiting for. You can see there's a website there. The Sesame Street television programming is accompanied by dissemination of materials for parents and teachers to reinforce the television program. Um, and it's based, the whole program is based on the principle that money is the strongest motivator for human learning and that saving money teaches self-control almost by accident and that this works even for very young children. So how should we think about universal interventions then? Um, to understand this, I like to think about our recent history. Modern countries like Britain entered the 20th century with a huge education gap, where only an elite few went to university, most people had only eight years of education, and many citizens did not know how to read at all. At that time, teaching literacy to the whole population was a societal goal for the early years of the 1900s. And that goal was met with a huge success. It's changed the quality of life for everyone and increased prosperity for whole countries. So we know educating the population is important. Today we've got a new factor in early life that seems to influence life success. Most everybody learns to read now, but self-control means so much more today than it ever did in the past. And I've shown you, I hope, that a person's level of health and wealth now follow in part from the self-control skills that they manage to master as children. The gradient I've shown you means that teaching better self-control skills to the whole population of children might become an interesting societal goal for this new century. So all this brings us an opportunity to initiate a civic dialogue about the kind of society we want. 
Um, I hope this lecture will stimulate those of you in the audience to go away and think about what kind of future you want for children growing up in Britain and what kinds of things could be done uh, to improve self-control to help them get there. So thank you very much. So I'd like to thank Prof Professor Moffat very, very much indeed for a fascinating look into the long-term importance of childhood self-control to individuals themselves and also to society. I'm struck that parents uh, ponder many things during the, the busy, stressful years and, and often long, sleepless nights of bringing up their children. You know, how important is stimulation or discipline? How will our children turn out? Is it nature? Is it nurture? Are they just going to be that way? When on earth will they stop having tantrums? But I'm quite sure that one thing that's not on the list that anxious parents think about is the potential future cost to society. Now, no matter how our own self-control developed in childhood, I go back to Alexander Pope who wrote something else that I seems to be useful for us all. He said, a man should never be ashamed to say that he has been in the wrong, which is but saying that he is wiser today than he was yesterday. We can always improve and learn. So Terry, thank you very much indeed for a, for a wonderful lecture. <laughs>